Yeah. I found then, as the year progressed in that first year, obviously there's an element of that in terms of there's a boundary. Friendship, um, obviously, you can't get too close to players and you want to keep a bit of distance. But there is a balance and it depends on you as a person as well. And what I found as the year progressed, I was like, I'm being too cold to players. I want to know more. I want to understand them more. I want to help them more. That's me. I'm very kind of intimate that way with people. Um, I want to help people. I enjoy helping people. I get satisfaction from, from helping people. I love workshops like these. I love working with students. I love it. I will help them as much as I can, open doors for them, guide them as much as I can. So me being cold and distant was like, this is not me. And it took me, the bones, maybe six, seven months to figure that out. And again, with, with experience, that comes. Being authentic then is, again, similar to be yourself, not trying to be someone else, not trying to be another coach, a successful coach. And again, that happens easy enough as well. So be you, because people will respond better to actually you. If I'm trying to be this other coach using his traits or behaviours, and another coach using some of his or she's behaviours, people will know quite quickly. They won't, they won't relate to you. They know that's not that person. He or she doesn't act that way normally. And, and if, if that happens, Connections are not going to be made. Trust is definitely not going to be there because I'm like, who is this person? I see him some days down the street, he's acting or she's acting completely different. Now he's different this week, next week he's saying different things as well. And it's like as if he's there trying to be someone else. So be yourself, we're all unique. We all have different characteristics, different skills. Be yourself. People will connect better with you. Uh, trust yourself. What does this mean or why would I put that in there, do you think? I think that's a really important one. So I think it's really important to trust yourself because there's so much, the way the game has been played among both, both codes, that it's easy to fall into a trap of going, this is the way we should play, versus is it your philosophy, is it based on your values, and then have you got a skill set then to play that, if you want to play that way, to be able to develop that into the game plan you want to go. And sometimes, I, I've learned that over the last, only the last couple of years, that if I want to play a certain way that I'm not going to be sort of guided by what's happening out there, by what other people are doing and how it's been done. And I've learned that um, through, I've just learned it through watching the games at the minute because if you look at teams playing now, I've seen a good few games this year, inter games, where teams are married to a system that when it doesn't work, they're struggling to get out of that system to be able to play a different style of game. And that's why I'm, I'm a big believer now of going trust yourself in terms of how you want to play, Brilliant. what you believe in, what your philosophy is. Use all the material that's out there, but don't follow it. Fabulous, yeah, very good. Someone else? Yeah, I suppose um, as a coach, you're going to make mistakes, and so are the players. So if you trust yourself, you're going to make mistakes, players will see that, they respect you for it. So you have to talk to about mistakes. Excellent, yeah, no, two answers, on the money, on the money to be honest, um, you get caught up, so coaches have to make decisions, and again managers, again the two are kind of interlined, and if you keep questioning yourself, you're just going to drive yourself bananas, and you're going to end up confusing yourself, confusing management, confusing the players, so trust yourself, trust your decision making, because you have to do it. And if you don't have that trust, players will see that, and they'll say the confidence is not there, and they'll know that trust, you're not, you're not trusting yourself. And you'll drive yourself bananas, you will, because you'll keep questioning. And look, you might do a small bit of questioning, but at least you say, look, decision's made, move on. And like that style of play, it's all chopping and changing. People have different ideas. Yeah, they have. You're in the position to coach for a year, two or three years. Do it your way. Okay, do it your way. And I, and I was thinking again, when I was with, with Offaly for three years, I was hearing different things to do this, do that. And I was like, look, I don't want to look back in 10 years' time saying, I've done it everyone else's way. I'm there to do it for three years. Why not have a cut off it and do it your way? Okay, so, and again, I know we're a lot of you are dealing with kids and stuff as well. Some of this stuff is it's, it's going to be softer, but again, I think it's important for you to just be authentic, be yourself. Be, if you're a very fun, outgoing, loving person, be all that. And then trust yourself, trust what you're doing. There's different ways to, to, there's different ways to do things. Okay, so multiple ways to do it. And we can all get to the same result or the same place. So the interpersonal skills side of things then, so obviously we've inter, we, we're, we're dealing with people. We have to talk to people, we have to build relationships. Okay, we have to possibly delegate, work with other coaches. And again, we gotta trust people, uh, and they gotta trust you. Building relationships, and uh, so how do we build relationships, first of all, especially working with kids and stuff? Like, how does this, it sounds simple again, but actually, how do we do it? Talk to them. Talk to them? So, commu so c communication is linked to this, isn't it? Yeah. We have to talk to them to build relationships. Okay, these, these two are very interlinked. 
Um, what else? What might you talk about? Yeah. Which? No, well, no, names. Yeah. no, so I'd have this question with a lot of, if I was working with a team of coaches or a team of selectors, I'd say, okay, let's, how long should it take for us to know um, the players' names, whether it's the kids or whether it's teenagers or whether it's adults? How long should it, should it be five sessions, ten sessions, should it be one session? Any thoughts? Early, as soon as possible. Yeah. Two or three sessions, you should know the names. Yeah. I'm not great at names, right? So what's that mean? Is that an excuse for me to say I'm not great at names? No, I work on it. The faces, who their parents are and so on. You link names to different things as well to, to remember them. Uh, so you do as much as you can. There's work in this. It's not a case of seeing them once a week and then you see them the following week and you're like, oh, what are these names again? Who are they? Even myself lecturing again, I'm dealing with students, new students every year. You have a sheet of paper, you get to know their names, their faces. And you know, if I see a name or if I can try and tag it to something, that actually I'll remember it. Um, that makes it a bit easier as well. So there's just a small bit of work in it. But two or three sessions max, you should know their names. It's insulting not knowing someone's name. It really is. And if you get their name wrong, mother of God. And I've done this loads of times in college uh, with students. And one time, with one, this is a, this is a, a le well, not, not a lesson, but just um, one young fella, I, I thought his name was Clifford. And I started calling him Clifford um, for about three months. And one day uh, he said something in, in one of my classes and I was like, good man Clifford, you're on the money with that one. And everyone started sniggering and I was like, tell me your name's Clifford. And uh, he's like, no. And I was like, it's, it's fucking Ray or something. So it was <laughs> something random. And uh, I was like, why didn't you tell me your name's not Clifford? You know, I've been calling you this for the last three months. You know, he goes, I just didn't want to say it to you. Like, you know, so, um, and again, look, like that's, it's, it, like he was fine about it. But again, a, a bit of embarrassment as well. Embarrassing on me uh, and on him and everyone would be kind of laughing underneath it all as well. So it's important to get the names right. And again, we will call them different things, different times, it's fine. But once you're trying to get around to that name, and, um, but yeah, two or three sessions max, we should know. There's no excuses in my eyes to go five, six, seven sessions. Um, Michael, sorry, just on that, like I found I'm involved with a couple of teams now, sometimes floating in and out, of more like you based on the teaching. So, like we remember names that make an impact. Mm. So it's really easy going to your first session and remember the five guys that lit the place up. Um, so I've kind of turned that on its head now when I go into things, and you try and remember the five lads who really aren't liking the place, because you'll know the other five, the top ten, by the end of the session. Brilliant. So it's just, uh, what's like to me, you know, it's easy yeah. to know the top guys, but it's the guy at the bottom that after the session you still don't know what the place is. And that's helping, them ma name. that's helping them massively. They're like, this person knows my name. Uh, and if you can... If you saw them last week and they're striking the ball maybe poorly in the left and this week it's a bit better to say, young Tom, that's actually, yeah, you're, you're, you're proving on that left uh, and you're building a relationship and connect, connecting with them stronger. There's something there, so you can't beat that. So, so, so important um, to know something about them, to know, their, you know how they're playing, the skills that they're working on and just keep developing that then week on week on week. And that's how you build relationships. That's how they get stronger. Um, at, at adult level, again, it's important to know their background in terms of what, what they're doing in college. You know, are they traveling a lot? Uh, girlfriends, boyfriends, all that kind of stuff. Are they part-time work? So very important to ask questions and then to remember it. And it, for me, you can be taking notes on this stuff. Have a, I, have, I have my phone notes. I like to keep stuff in that. I have a copy book as well, but I more so use my phone. And uh, I do take notes. When, I, when, I, when it's managing, I would take notes to remember things. Um, about players because you can't remember everyone like if 30 something players you have nearly 20 um, staff as well which is so it's a monster and you got to take time with this and make effort on it so what do effective coaches look like so tell me what's, what's an effective coach again stay away from the skills and all that stuff for the moment in terms of interpersonal skills what are we looking at what are, who are effective coaches are or what traits should they have good communicators good communicators be approachable. pardon be approachable be good positive Positive, yeah, good. We, we know a lot of people who ain't, who ain't too positive and they come across just negative the whole time. That's, it could be a blind spot that they have. We'll talk about that shortly. What else? Be organised. Be organised. Oh, God, good, yeah. Be organised, especially when you're working with uh, underage teams. In an ideal scenario, you'd love to have all your cones set up and give yourself five, six minutes for when they all come in and you're there. You're there chilled out, relaxed, talking to them. Again, building relationships. Very hard to build it during a session, so... It's, it's nearly before and primarily after is when you get a chance to talk to the kids. So ideally, you like to have those five, six, seven minutes actually when they come in, say hello, what, how was school and so on. So you've got to find those times. 
Uh, you mentioned a few important things earlier. What's your first name? Jonathan. Jonathan. Values and philosophy. Okay, and my, people might say, oh God, you don't, you don't need to know that for kids maybe. And look, you might need to have it, you know, it'll, it'll evolve in time, but I think you need to figure out what you're about. You want to set up an environment. Paul mentioned development earlier on, improvement. He said, his thing is improvement. I, I've no doubt that's a part of his philosophy, improvement. Mine would be again creating an environment where kids or teenagers or, player, or adults are challenged. It's an environment where you know, they're learning in all areas of psycho psychology, um, coaching, um, the physical side of things. And I want them to become, become independent, to make decisions for themselves in the field. That's the environment I'd love to have. And writing out your philosophy, this took me a bit of time, and this will take time to evolve. And I, I challenge you to do it yourselves. What is your philosophy? You should have an idea of what it is, especially if you work with teams. Is it a fun, caring environment? Is it a challenging environment? Is it an improvement? Is it a development? What is it? Write it down. Because that needs to be seen in each session. That needs to be seen in, in, in most, if not all, the sessions. And Michael, just, just on that, like I was a GPO for four years, and the philosophy is hugely important because what I would have learned through a juvenile club setting was because if you don't have it written down, if you don't meet management teams at the start of the year, even at under nines, tens, elevens, one coach will want to have it enjoyable one coach will want to win that will come to a head at some mm. stage it generally it always does so like your philosophy and have it written down the start of the year which can become sort of like your, your blueprint for the year what do you want to achieve with our under nines want to have fun want to give them this skill this skill this skill brilliant there's your little blueprint for your coaches and your parents and it's very clear but if you don't have that eventually it yeah. will at some stage come to loggerheads where then all of a sudden you're not a sort of mentor you're not a coach developer you're mediating between people that are having yeah. loggerheads so. no that's Dr. these points are excellent and if you'd go back near to the start of the year i bring in all the parents and tell them your philosophy tell them what the plan is for the year communicate it clearly this is this is who i am this is what i'm about these are my values respect hard work and so on whatever they are and say, this is what I'm going to be doing for the year. I'm going to be working, trying to improve your sons or your daughters uh, in the areas of hurling or Gaelic football, or whatever it is. And you're laying out what exactly to expect. And that will prevent, as you said, that loggerheads coming together. You will have all that bit of conflict, a small bit, but it'll be much softer and easier. And you, you know, all you need to say is, go back to when I met everyone. A parent comes at you, look and say, why is my kid not playing? Or why is my kid taken off? And so on. Go back to, to the day I spoke to you. This was the plan. Everyone is happy, no one questions that day, everyone agreed. It just makes life easier. You will always have challenges going forward, but it's, it's, it's really nice. And the philosophy is one part, values and standards. So again, value and standi standards are interlinked. Um, so again, standards could be just, it could be attitude. So look, I want to, again, look at our kids, like, you know, so they're going to evolve, they're going to learn and so on. And it's probably maybe for a little later, but you like to have a good attitude coming into training, the right attitude, it's a positive one. Um, so these are some of the areas, and you've said them all, understanding yourself, your own self-awareness, your philosophy, and write it down. There's no point thinking in your head, oh yeah, I have my philosophy. Write it down. You'll write and write and write and look at it and read it out and say, God, is that it? Strong communicator. Do you, how long do you talk for? What words do you use? Do you waffle? Do you practice actually maybe saying, sorry, practice maybe coaching a skill or, or a game do you practice doing that maybe at home beforehand to hit, to hit the points that you want to hit? Now again, in time, the more you do it, the more you get better at it, uh, obviously. But less talk, the better. Kids, you know, if you go off waffling and giving long sentences and goes on for a couple of minutes, psh, not a chance. You've lost them. We'll come to that a little later as well. Take time to say hello to kids. Uh, being organised for your session, so you got them all, to be fair. And you're supporting the kids on their growth journey. You, you are going to leave a, a possible mark here. Leave a positive mark. Leave, like I still remember back to my days when I was actually um, in summer camps even, I remember, um, and what I learned. Um, back then you didn't play maybe until maybe under 12 at the club. But I remember the school. I remember all these small little things during my journey. I remember all that stuff. Like, if you asked me something last week, I'd struggle. Um, but if, if you were going back 20 plus years, I can remember it. So those, those people have had a big and important um, impact on my career and my life. And again, you'd like to maybe leave your mark on that next generation. Communication is massive. And everyone, this has been mentioned a few times already. And, and it's really significant that we still keep talking about it because communication is everything. We communicate our philosophy. We communicate um, our game plans. We, com we communicate, we build relationships with players. 
everything revolves around the communication. There's a sender and receiver, very, very basic. So normally, again, a coach would be sending information. And then there's a receiver. Are they receiving it? Parts. Parts of it. And which parts? Hard to know. Does one understand it? Does two understand it? So how do we actually know that they understand your message that you're giving them? Ask them a question, very good. Ask them a question about what you just said. So that's one person out of maybe 30. How do you know the, 20, the rest of 29 know it? So this is a challenge in part, who's, who's listening, who's not? So you might say to the next person, um, Tom, what did John just say there? And you'd be hoping he'd be able to replicate it as well. So now he's after understanding it, okay? So again, you can't obviously go into all of them, but you'd like to actually just throw it around there. Because next thing then, other boys are like, he could come to me next time. He could come to me, and you're moving it around. So everyone now is kind of attention span is increased. They know they need to pay attention. And you could reward players with a small reward, a grip or something as well, saying your, your attention was excellent there. Next thing then, the rest of them are thinking, I might get something the next day. Because there's no point, there's no point you communicating if you're not listening. Waste, you're wasting your time, wasting their time. So you've got to keep their attention. There's different types of verbal, as I'm talking here. We have some visual stuff here as well. We have non-verbal. What do you mean by non-verbal? language and expand further again go deeper so what kind of what type of body language show me if you're, if you're giving them instruction you care for them to understand check them to understand just can you show me how to do that scale or does okay. someone want to show me okay go, go back again so let's say I'm the coach what's my body language so it's my hand gestures. I'm je I like to do hand gestures, I think. So um, I do that. My tone of voice, I raise it and bring it down. Um, my face. So Brian Cody in Crow Park, when it's full, um, sometimes, again, very, very hard to hear five metres away in terms of someone's calling you, not alone, someone on the sideline. But just within the wind, you might hear, I might hear fennel, and I'd be able to, you know, my attention would come across to the sideline. And do you think I could hear Brian from all the way over there? Do you think, what message are you going to send me? What do you think he's doing? Hand okay, so his hand gestures. Yeah. Now he's not, not waving a finger, thankfully, or he's not bringing it this way either. <laughs> his uh, fists are out, hat's on again, I have a visual of this, and he's like this, red, big red head in him, the hat on, fists are out. So I presume that message was, let's get going here now. Let's fucking drive it. Or else it could be like, you're coming off in a few minutes if you don't get going. Uh, I, I hope it wasn't that, but I pres presumed it was, now is the time to get going. And that's all I needed. The two fists together and a red head. And it was just that. That's you know, strong kind of stature as well. To drive it. And that's all you need. That's, that's body language. And, and people resonate with body language way more than our words. So keep thinking that your body language, your tone of voice as well. And to bring me to that next piece here, now I'll just flick onto it for a second. Body movements, face, arms, 55% is what people take in. The pauses, again, I'm, I'm not great at that, I need to improve on it more. Do I pause long enough for people to digest the information? We get awkward on pauses, but we need to get more awkward. We need to, we need to get um, comfortable with it. And then the words end in something like 7%. So just, again, you have no doubt you've heard that before, but I need to reinforce it more, that just the arm movements, your face, is so important. Again, if you're mad, obviously, you're going, probably going to be red-faced, um, but people see that. Without even opening your mouth, you say, there's a redhead, this person is not happy. Coming into the dressing room after not playing well, you know the manager probably not going to be happy by looking at him. If I'm just going back here, okay, so yeah, non-verbal is good, okay, to convey the message. Um, Interpersonal communication theory, that's just a theory basically. And again, I'm not going to be boring you with theories or anything like that, but that just links communication with relationships. When I talk to someone, like, that's how you can build a relationship. Use certain words to, to build, to connect with them. That's how you do it, okay? And it's, it's just through talking. A good listener, what's a, who's a good listener? How do you know someone's a good listener? They don't, don't interrupt you. It's good. They're not asleep. They're not asleep. <laughs> they receive the message. They receive the message. Okay. Eye contact. Eye contact. Good. I don't want to ask you 
question. Oh, very good. They've asked a question now of actually what you just said. And that reinforces. Well, what do you mean by that? Like? That reinforces they've listened. Yeah, now, hopefully you'll have a bit more meaning on that. You, you'd have to pull out a few of the words because what they mean by that is like, has he or she even just listened to me? Like, so pull out, pull out, pull out those words, but, but we have no context here. Um, but what normally happens? What do we do? What, what happens when we're chatting to friends and stuff in a coffee shop, maybe? What, what, when they're talking, what are we doing? Nodding. We're nodding, but what, what are we thinking? One, thing what, what are we going to say next? And you're just praying they're going to stay quiet so you can actually cut in uh, for your piece. And you might interrupt them. You might cut, cut them. And um, again, I was a poor, poor listener. Poor listener. And again, just learned from actually hearing about this and then actually sitting down with a friend or two in a coffee shop and me bursting to try and say something like, okay, I need to actually just listen, eye contact. And just, just pause and take time to listen. That's a good listener. And I would say most of us probably are not maybe good listeners. Now, some people are very good. I think other people then are just ecstatic to get their point across. So again, we've got to be good listeners. And if you're not a good one, you've got to improve on it. Open lines of communication. So within my research that I've done, I've got a lot of perspectives from players, from managers, from coaches, from physios. So I was very interested in what's all their perspectives. And I looked at the first year of the manager at, at inter-county level. So what's happening at, in the first year? And what I want to see maybe is what mistakes are they making? Because if we know what mistakes they're making and, and there's commonality, well then you know, hopefully managers who step into that ring in their first year won't make the same ones and they'll know actually they need to watch out for these ones. So that's the whole kind of concept of, of, of doing that PhD. And open lines of communication. Who do you think this came from? What, what group did, should, did this come from? Players. Players bursting for information. Let us know what's going on. Let us know what's happening. Even with certain decisions that are quite big, let them know why you made that decision. There's nothing as bad. Again, some players dropped. Nobody knows why he's dropped. Nobody knows what's going on. There's rumors going around. Like, let the players know what's happening. Something is, like, you know, that's the open line. So they're very, that's more adult level. Uh, and I'd say club and intercounty. They want to know more. They want to talk. They want to give feedback. They want to have a say. Clarity is clarity. Again, we're clear, we're concise. We're not saying one thing this week and saying another, another week, saying another next week. A different thing. Clarity. You don't want people walking away as in, what, what did you just say there? Or, oh, I'd actually, I'm misunderstanding what he said. It has to be clear. The length of time you speak for, again, it's got to be short. Shorter the better. If you're having a huddle on the field, Again, no doubt most, most people now are, are doing this now a lot more, which is go down training sessions, having a huddle down the hurling field or, or the Gaelic football field. How long do you talk to players for there, if you're having a little huddle? Mm. Anyone else? Less. Less even again, yeah, so you've got to keep it sharp. It's nearly two minutes, I'd say, nearly. Now, it depends on the message. It depends what's going on. Context is everything. But you've got to keep it sharp. Okay, sharp to the point. What I highly recommend here as well is get one of your coaches or get someone, a friend, to video record you in that, in that little huddle. When you're talking to players, video record you. Why would I recommend that? Listen to it. Listen to it. Are you repeating yourself? Oh, gee. Good, repeating yourself. Would you be embarrassed looking at maybe if you had to hazard a guess? Absolutely. <laughs> Don't realise you're doing it. Don't realise you're doing it. These are the blind spots. Our eyes look out the way. We can't see yourself, so you need someone to look at you. And a camera's better again because that's, that's accurate. That's, that's not going to lie to you. Someone's, someone else might be soft on you, saying, oh, no, it's just lovely, it's just good. You've got the point across there. And then, <laughs> and then you look back and you're like, oh, God. I uh, presented for the, the academies last in January. So we had 600 people in the room, parents and a uh, mixture of parents and a mixture of, obviously, players and we had county board officers. We had a mixture of everyone now, so it wasn't a group like yourselves that you know kind of you can get your message across so it kind of makes me message because you're dealing with parents dealing with players and other, other people but it was recorded and I look back at it and um, I kept saying this is important and I was mortified by the end of it to be honest like and I said it here once or twice already because I'm, I'm aware of it now but any slide I put up I'm like this is important now this is important like everything's important obviously like but I kept saying it and I was like and, and I could see it and I said to some lads said, I kept saying this is important did you see that he goes no I didn't realise it um they didn't see it as bad, but just for myself, again, change up the wording. This is significant. This is interesting. This is something I want you to look at going, for going forward. So 
change it up. Um, and that language, again, goes back to language and communication. Any questions on that so far? We'll take a, we'll take a pause for a second because um, we know communication now is important. We know maybe video recording yourself is going to be very beneficial. Be brave, do it. Just be brave and do it. Get to record on your phone, so it's not another person's phone, and they can't send it anywhere. So it's on your phone, uh, you know. And, and, and like that, you'll be. You, you could be waffling, and it could be. You could. You could have said maybe a minute of of of, uh, of words, and it could have just five words could have done to get your message across. In that case, like so, shorten it down as much as it can. Analogies are brilliant for kids, for for teenagers, for adults. Analogies. They will, um, we, we sh with their cues as well, and I'll come to that in a short as well. Sorry, Michael, a question there. How many points should you, at half time, or beforehand, should you? Should you be, should you be winning by? Oh, I should hopefully. How many points? Yeah, you gotta, it depends what's happening in the game, but two or three points is where you're at. Like, There's stuff there as well that we say that we, we probably don't need to say as well. I'm right in saying that there's stuff there that that's, this is. This is mandatory that we don't need to be saying, repeating ourselves, because we end up repeating ourselves, repeating ourselves, repeating ourselves, there's no need. This is known, we know this. And you said, what, two or three pints? Three max. And you've got to be slow on it too, give each pint time and space as well. And again, what, what, what I like to see is actually give the players, what are you seeing? Tell me what you're seeing. I find and that very good at half time, team down, go right, ask them what they think. Where are we going, lads? What's going on? And they, 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 and they, they normally they, know. They, they make the platform for it. Then. Yeah. They, they know themselves it's not going right. Yeah. And fingers crossed, no one says the wrong answer. <laughs> and you're like, and you're like, oh, jeez, what's this that saying? No. No. Right, so the, the open lines of communication, even at that half time, how, like, some players don't say anything. And, and they probably, I don't know what to refer to. How do you claim draw at that old answer? Mm -hmm. So some, some yeah. players won't want to talk in a group, right? Yeah. That's their personality. Um, and now that can improve in time, without a doubt. But you don't want to be putting them on the spot either, like, yeah. you know? So you would like to encourage, everyone has an opinion. Everyone's a leader, lads. Everyone has advice. What do you think? But you need to make the environment safe early on in the year before you, you can get to that. Um, you know, some guys have just big opinions as well, and they will give their opinion. They want to give it. And, and they're some vocal key leaders that you love to have. But the quieter fella, it could be the case of asking him because you know he knows the answer and you know the environment is safe and we expect everyone to, to offer something. Um, but it, it needs to be nearly built right. Does that make sense? Yeah. That you just don't randomly call him out in, in the middle of a half time where the environment is threatening maybe and he's, he, he's, he wasn't expecting it either. Um, if that makes sense. So yeah, get it from the players and then you can probe and you can influence and you give your piece as well. And more than likely you'll compliment what they said um, on that side of it. Leadership, now, we'll, we'll take a little pause here for a second. This will be something for you to do now to think about. So one of the questions in the survey was, what leadership style would you prefer to work under if you are a player? Okay, so this was for the players only, 700 players, former current, within a 10-year frame between 2011 and 2020. Okay, that was the, the, the timeline that I got to these players. 700 of them. I asked them this question, so again, they were players, obviously. Um, and, and we'll, sorry, we'll come to this answer in a few minutes. But, but for you at the moment, right? So, sorry, I have two slides here. For you at this very moment in time, if you were a player again, what leadership style would you like um, for your manager to be? So you're a player and you have a manager or a coach. What leadership style would you like them to have that would suit you? Now, I don't want you to shout it out or anything. Um, I want you to have a think about it, discuss it for a second maybe. So have a look at the answers that are here. And pick one maybe that you feel that you love your manager to be or your coach to be. So you can chat for a second amongst yourselves maybe. I'll give you 45 seconds. Okay, so what would you like to be? What, 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 sorry, what manager style would you like them to have? C. C, motivational? All of those. So, so hands up A, for example. Give me a hands up A. Hands up B. No, nice and high so I can see. Hands up B. No autocratic. So, oh, yeah, one or two. Good stuff. 
Uh, motivational? Okay. Uh, submissive? Uh, submissive, actually, what that means is just you're, you're taking a step back. You're actually letting the players kind of do a lot of the, lot of the coaching, maybe, in a way, or just making a lot of decisions. So you're very much stepping back. All of the above in different situations? Okay. Uh, okay, so most hands were for E, obviously, there. So why, why E? It's a very subjective situation dealing with the player, dealing with the, the maturity of the player, dealing with where they are and in, in their development stream. It, it, you can't just pick one and stick to one. Has to, you have to tailor your approach, really. Not even to each player, but even the, the situation that you're discussing with the player. Yeah. What's your name? Adrian. Adrian, bye. You could be up here delivering this now, so you could. <laughs> <laughs> So every situation will require a different leadership style or a different approach, okay, 100%. The player, the environment, the, what's after happening, the context. So all of that will require someone to t take a step back maybe. A manager needs to take a step back. He needs to figure this out himself maybe, uh, or he or she. Autocratic, again, sometimes we've got to make decisions and say, lads, this is the way it is. We're going this way. There's too many opinions here nearly. We're going that way. That's what we're doing. Motivational, obviously we know motivational and it speaks for itself. You want someone to to you know, give you that excitement, give you that drive. Um, and then democratic. Democratic obviously then is very much listening to what people have to say. The manager or the coach still makes the decision, but you're listening, okay? And like that in every situation, okay? So you're on the money. Um, do you think the players from 2011 to 2020 said the same as yourselves? So again, I have the answer here basically. Do you think they picked all of the both? Um, or do you think that they went for autocratic or democratic or motivational? I think like one player might want to be very democratic because I like to talk and I like to get my opinion. Another player might not want to be that involved. So I would imagine players would be A, B, C, or D mm. themselves. If they're, if they're answering you, what do I want? Mm. So my preference could be I really want the motivation of you know manage. Yeah, very good. But I think other players, you know, what they say. Well, I think. It, just depends on the different personalities within the within the squad. Yeah, very good. And we'll come to uh, like we'll have a cohort here that we want X or X or Y here now in a second. So which one do you think was the least favourite? <laughs> okay, so D. So submissive was the least favourite. Only one percent went for that. Which is next then? A. B. 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 Excellent. Six percent. Okay, out of seven hundred. Which one's next? Motivation. This, this, this happens a lot, and I've done this a few times with companies and different things, and everyone thinks motivation is, is up higher, um, funnily enough. Um, 70%? Yeah, I should have held on to that one, uh, but I think we all know E is the answer. Uh, Democratic was 30%, which is quite high. That, that, is, that is substantial. Uh, and all of the above in different situations was 48. Okay, so if you look at all of the above and even Democratic together, that's, that's, your, that's your nearly 80%. High 70s. Um, any thoughts on that? Again, I look, your, your point is on the money. It's every situation requires a different. Sometimes a manager or a coach has to be motivational, has to drive the team. You have to be auto autocratic, you have to be submissive. You know, you want players to understand, to lead as well, and, and for them to figure things out. You've got to take a step back. Declan Kidney would have been very good at that as a coach with Munster when he was uh, involved then. He would take a step back in meetings and he'd throw out kind of a little spanner to the players. How are we going to beat uh, Northampton the weekend? And why would he do that with that group though, that Munster group at that time for any rugby people? Like oh. leaders leaders. Leaders. Yeah, who's in that room off the top of your head? Paul O'Connell. Who else is in there? Mick Galway. Galway, a little later, but it's still a great man and he'd, he'd, have, a, he'd have a voice as well. Um, O'Gara. Stringer. Quinlan. Stringer. There's a few more. It's just a monstrosity of a group of leaders, of guys who want to give their opinions, aren't they? What happened then, they'd be all nearly giving out to each other and going at it, and the next thing, anyway, they'd come to an agreement, like, right, that's what we do out in the field, and we train that way, you know? So Kidney was smart. Other coach managers would want them to be coming up with the solutions. I came up with this. I was the smart one here. But again, you have to have humility to, you have to be a very smart coach to let players figure things out. I'd say, um, length of time that you might have a team for. Like if you were involved in a college team, you only have them from October if you're lucky to February if you're lucky. So you're kind of looking for the leaders, the county lads, kind of pushing on them a little bit as well. Whereas if you have a club team, you get them in October and you have to run through to yeah. the following September. 
like that, that gap is oh that, that, that gap is very short there like you've got to get in straight away and you have a style of play like there's no lads we're going to sit down here now and chat with us for a few weeks it's like again you'll talk to them maybe in the first session too but you have to have a plan oh you're straight into it that, that's a different challenge altogether I, I think it's important as well that everyone realises they've strengthened weaknesses like I personally was struggling with all four of those I couldn't be necessarily uh, submissive you know or democratic so there might be someone else in the team who's better at being one of those so like it doesn't have to be one person that can be all of those things. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent within your coaching team, is it? Yeah. Yeah, very good. No, and it can be a nice balance there then as well, because that person is balancing your personality. And again, we, we don't want we don't want anyone to change your personality. Again, you will probably predominantly be one of them, um, and you're trying to balance out. If I'm very autocratic, I probably do need someone that's a bit more democratic, and someone actually will make sure that I'm not missing that uh, to balance myself out if I'm, if I'm not organised as well maybe as a manager I, I want to make sure that actually someone in my group is very good at organisation I obviously need to improve on it still but you want someone who just loves it um, and so on ok we'll move on that, this, this piece is nearly done um, leadership leadership so, so again what kind of came through from this then I suppose was yeah all, all of the both basically so it was um, when you start looking up then different leadership styles what came was like situational leadership um, slash adaptable leadership and adaptable is in the middle here and again we have to be an adapt adaptable leader to, to, to different situations and in this case this model here just looked at three different types servant transformational transactional again I'm not going to confuse you or anything or go into this in detail but servant leadership is someone who emphasizes on people so all about people want to improve people Whereas transformational, it could be about the winning the league, um, winning each match, and, and so on. So again, your emphasis is very much on objectives. You're still trying to drive the team, make the team better, um, but it, you're doing it through achieving the objectives, um, and so on. Servant is, is not really focused on objectives. It's more, um, and probably some of yourselves, maybe more on the, the development side of things, especially for younger age groups. And transaction, then again, there's not much of a connection with the, with the players or with the people. It's very much... A bit colder, your emphasis on management, just get the job done and go on. Okay, there's, there's not a huge amount of interaction and trying to, to, to improve. Um, that was that leadership side of things. And, and anything else to share on that from, from the research? Yeah, I think that just came strong in. First year manager, no leadership, lacking leadership. But like, what is it? What, what's, what are they lacking? And it's the communication, the relationships, making decisions, being, you know, being clear, all that kind of stuff, having a plan. That's all leadership. Those, all those qualities uh, revolve around leadership. But if you're, if you're a poor speaker, like that leader, like you're not going to be a good leader if you're a poor speaker. Because people, people will follow you if you're, if you're a strong communicator. They'll follow you if you're a strong communicator. But if you're not able to communicate your message, geez, there's not a chance that someone's going to follow you. So in terms of session plans, okay, uh, our session design, now getting conscious of the coaches we have here, like, you're probably not going to get out, you know, spend hours on an under six session. But, uh, but yeah, you need to plan your sessions. Um, I, anytime I do the session with, with, with a team, again, so I, I don't expect myself to, to memorize it. So we could be coaching 15, 20 years, you could have all your sessions memorized, but I'd always have a clipboard, and I'd always have a session on it. And this helps me to remind me of the different components of it, the different cues of what I want, um, and just make sure I'm not missing anything. Because again, sessions are vital. The amount of time you have with, with players is vital and we should maximise all our time with it. Um, and how can you remember everything? Uh, now again, that's me going into more deta detail, uh, but I think there's elements of that I think we need to delve deeper into in terms of our session plans. So what's this here mean, do you think? What's the idea? Have targets, okay, good. Anything else? Practice. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Good. So. Okay. Good. Good. So it could be all that, right? But that's where I'm getting to. Okay. It's like, what's the goal of the session here, right? And I do feel we're in the dark, and we're just throwing darts at the wall to try and at the targets there somewhere. But we're in the dark throwing them. We're hoping they're going to land. Some of them might land. We do this because we've done it years ago or someone done it last year and we're just duplicating and copying. We're actually not really thinking about actually why we're doing it and what's the purpose of it. And for me, we're definitely just throwing darts and I see it constantly at, at club level. 
it just goes on and on and on. And it's good, kids are down, they're enjoying it, they're, they are, some, there's some form of learning, I've no doubt, but what is the plan here? Okay, so challenge of training sessions, there's no goal in the session. Skills are isolated. Now again, at this level, at underage, you do, need, you do need to have skills isolated because they have a lot going on, even, even for them to strike a ball or whatever it may be, catching a ball and so on. We have to have isolation, without a doubt, at that level. As you progress then, I suppose, as you get older, you want to blend those isolated skills with more game-based stuff. Now again, I know you're probably sick of hearing game-based, but it's, that's what happens in games. We, we, we have to make decisions in games. There's kids running around everywhere. Like, these linear drills that we constantly do and we overdo them, how do they reflect the game? There's very, little, there's very little transition in my eyes. There's some transition, we have to do it. It'll never go away from the game, but we gotta bring it more into more game situations. Okay, and we can, we can have constraints and so on, and I'll come to that in a second. Uh, small set of games with a focus of possession. So again, some people might think small set of games, possession, 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 I see possession going on. There's 20, 30 hand passes. How many hand passes do I do in a game? Uh, I, don't, I don't think I do that amount. And normally if we get one or two hand passes off, do we go hand passing again or do we, we try and deliver it maybe? So again, we, we might overdo it. There is a place for it, but I just feel it's overdone. Um, and that's what we think of small set of games, we, we think of possession. Language then, so different between your coaching team. So again, I, I could have a certain language of certain words I'm using, support play. Sometimes could be saying a third man runner. Um, you know, there could be different words used. So we, we probably should try and keep it similar, if we can, to avoid confusion. And even yourself, you could be using different words the whole time. So why not actually maybe just write out a list of words that you're gonna use um, when you're looking at support play or you're looking at tackling or rooking, whatever it is, it's a key word and you constantly use it. Okay, so there's no confusion on it. No cues, what do you mean by cues? Pardon? It's like a hint to do something. Exactly that. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a hint. There's probably two or three words uh, in it. Um, instead of you saying a long sentence to actually to instruct something, it's two or three words and they know what it is. So I, th I think, let's say in rugby, for example, when um, I think when, when lads used to fall to the ground, used to roll and land. So style of play, again, non existent. Principle is non existent in the session. So again, it's just, we're actually we're just teaching skills is what I find, it's just skills, that's it. We're, we're, we're teaching catching, uh, striking, all the, all the skills of the game, but they don't fall into principles of what actually happens in the game. So we have to do both. So guided coaching versus, uh, have a look at this here, have a read this one for a second. Guided coaching. Does everyone here do this? Don't be shy now, yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> I presume everyone does this because if you're dealing with seven, eight, 10, 12, you have to guide them, don't you? Yeah. To a certain degree, exactly, to a certain extent. But are we instructing, instructing, instructing? Are we doing it for too long? Okay, and, and for me, we, could, we might be spoon feeding, spoon feeding players a little. My father would have trained me or managed me all the way up, up from a child the whole way to adult. Um, and I'm just thinking of his, of his coaching style. Like he would have used guided coaching an awful lot. He actually would have be tell us where the ball is dropping even. Now, brilliant, uh, helped us an awful lot during games and trainings and all that, but probably didn't do near enough of the guided discovery, where actually guided discovery is the method many coaches use to help players develop the mentality through questioning, solving problems, and probing. So get the players to figure it out themselves, as, as we know. But I guarantee you we're probably not doing it enough. We're probably doing too much, we're too heavy handed maybe on the guided coaching. We need to do more on the discovery. And that takes time. That's, that's huddles within sessions. Uh, you've got to have a bit of patience with this. Again, normally we like to go from drill to drill to drill to drill and, and have it have maybe snappy, take time through it. So we need to take that balance between both. Depends on the age group, depends on their level of ability and so on. Um, but I think we just need to balance that. So keep that in the back of your minds, it's a nice one. I think that you can use within your sessions. That's problem-based learning, probing problems. I'm not gonna go through that. Uh, influence and hints. Uh, everyone's dream is to have self-thinking players, have them independent, that they will learn from their own mistakes to be able to make decisions on the field. 
and we don't need as much instruction on the sideline. That's where we want to go to, okay? I'm conscious of time here now, I'd say. I'm probably running tight, I'd say. Um, so yeah, limited instruction. Now, like that's, that, that'd be part of my philosophy in terms of trying to make players just you know, understand it themselves. If, if a team ends up doing a, a plus one or a sweeper, let's we call it a sweeper, like, like my own team are not looking at me straight away saying here, what do we do? They're after maybe figuring out themselves for maybe a couple of minutes. And if I need to actually change our sweeper or something, I can do it. But already they've changed it. They've already they've responded to it. But most teams will, and this is adults, they'll look to the sideline, what do we do? Again, where is the coaching here? And as a coach, maybe, has the coach failed there a little? I think, I think that person has. When do you let them kind of make their own decision down the field? So, why do you let the team kind of... Mm. So, why, why am I doing it right? You, you're coming up against a team, um, a Waterford maybe, or who likes to do sweepers? Uh, <laughs> Come up against a team that's, you, you know, they're likely to do a sweeper, okay? So you have a training session ahead of you, and what you might do is, you, you hopefully have a 15 on, vi on fift 15, 15, grab one of the players, bring them back as a sweeper. Look at what the other team does, and that, that'd be your first 15, basically. See how they react, what do they do, and let it, let it play out. Pause it, bring them in. Lads, what happened there? Oh, geez, we, you know, no, one, no one said anything about a sweeper going back. I wasn't sure, was he there or not, and so on. But what did you do to respond to it? Get them thinking, you know, who is the player, ask them, who's the player most comfortable on the ball in the backs? Who do you think should be maybe a sweeper? Now again, you have to guide them as well, and obviously you don't want four or five answers coming out with, with four or five backs saying that they could do it. Um, but get them thinking about it. If this happens, as we need to react to it. And straight away, we know Michael is actually comfortable on the ball. He'll become our plus one if a team does it. Uh, and this is the structure we're going to have. And you can ask them, what structure do they think that, do they think that we should have? So they're going, to, they're going to have something around the center area. Where do we keep the ball from? We keep it out of the center. We go to the wings and so on. So that's the kind of way to do it. Um, it's in the training session where you're preparing them, where they're going to get comfortable with it. Um, and, and throw that little spanner into the works. Like, do that without telling them and see how they react. Bring them in. That's your problem solving. 